Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Yes, Mike. Guess I'm coming through in this microphone, okay? I know, I don't need it. So Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to start out, going to read the first two verses here as we get started. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Don't, mench, don't miss that. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. And so I talked a lot uh, last week in my introduction to the book of Daniel. This, this attack here when King Nebuchadnezzar and his army uh, besieged Jerusalem. Um, this attack mentioned in these verses here was the beginning of a very important time. A period of time Jesus called the what? Remember from last week? I talked about it a good bit. Very good, Daniel. The times of the Gentiles. Jesus used that phrase in Luke 21, verse 24, in reference to the Gentiles' ongoing occupation and domination of Jerusalem. That began with King Nebuchadnezzar, and it would continue until, as Jesus said, the times of the Gentiles would be... Remember anybody? Fulfilled. Fulfilled. I believe when Jesus spoke about the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles, He was referring to all of Daniel's prophecies about, it, about this time of the Gentiles and that it would, would not be fulfilled until the things that we eventually we will get to and study that Daniel said about how when these times would finally come to a close. This Gentile domination of Jerusalem would include the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70, but the ultimate fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles will not happen until that terrible time that Jesus described Himself in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24, the tribulation period, the rise and the fall of the Antichrist, a time which, of course, again, the prophet Daniel wrote about, as Jesus referred back to Daniel. The time of the Gentiles is this extended period of time when the land that was given in covenant by God to Abraham and to Abraham's physical descendants is occupied by Gentile powers during this time of the Gentiles, and there will be no rightful heir sitting on the throne of David as king of Israel. There has not been since this Je Jehoiakim, who's, who's mentioned here in these opening verses, since he was deported, there has not been a descendant of David on the throne in Israel, and still not today. But there will be, eventually, and that will be none other than whom? Jesus, Jesus Christ Himself, His human side, descended from the tribe of Judah and from... David, from, from David, because again, it has to be a king descended from the line of David was to be the Messiah. The times of the Gentiles then began with this invasion of Jerusalem that we're reading about in these first two verses here. 605 B.C. by, and I again, I call him King Nebi to make it a little shorter. King Nebi mentioned here in these first verses. And these times will continue until the Messiah, who? Jesus. The Lord Jesus returns when? At the end of the tribulation period. At that time, then, at that time, Messiah Jesus will subdue nations. He will deliver the land of Israel from its Gentile occupants. And He will bring the nation of Israel into the kingdom that God promised her. 
And he will be king of that kingdom that we refer to as the millennial kingdom. God made a covenant with Israel just before she entered the promised land. And in that covenant, God gave the rules by which he would deal with them as a nation. If Israel was an obedient nation, God would what? Bless the nation. These were promises to the corporate nation of Israel. If they were an obedient nation, God said, I will bless you. If they were a disobedient nation, He would what? Curse them and punish them. He told them this right before they entered the promised land. And He actually told them that the ultimate discipline that He would use to correct them was what? Generally speaking, was what? What was happening here now? The invasion of Gentile armies and countries and rulers to dominate them or occupy their, the land that they were promised. These Gentile nations would put Jews under their authority. These Gentile nations would disperse the Jews from their land, take them in exile to foreign countries. God would not take away that discipline from His chosen nation Israel until they would turn away from their sin against Him. Until they would turn to Him in true faith and obey His requirements. You can read about this in Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 32. And I would actually encourage you to read those chapters as a background for what we're diving into here in the book of Daniel. And if you read those chapters in Deuteronomy, when God said these things to the nation of Israel, you will see that God said He would eventually end His discipline against Israel. He actually told them, I'm telling you, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you don't obey me, I'll curse you. And guess what? You're not going to obey me, and I'm going to curse you. But then He also said, but I will eventually relieve you of that punishment of that discipline, of that curse. And you will also see if you read in there that nowhere there, nowhere in any other prophets of the Old Testament that God ever said that He would not fulfill His ultimate promise to Israel. He never said that. He never said He would forever abandon Israel as a nation. He never said He would rescind His promises to her. Many, again, the reality is that many teach that God has done that. That God has rescinded His promises to Israel and now they are to be fulfilled in the church. I, I don't find anywhere in the Bible that it says that. And I guarantee you when you look at God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament, you will not find that. In fact, God said the opposite. Essentially, He said things like when the stars fall out of the heavens and, and the world and the universe doesn't operate the way I made it, then that's whenever I will fail to have Israel as a nation before me. In other words, when pigs fly. Well, Israel sinfully divided into two kingdoms after the death of what, which Israelite king? No, actually, Solomon. After, after the death of King Solomon, Israel divided way, way, before, way before Zedekiah, and, and they, they were toward the end of, uh, of Israel. But um, after King Solomon died, who was whose son? David. David's son. After he died, um, God allowed these sinful na the sinful nation to actually divide into two nations, the northern and the southern kingdoms. Um, God allowed the northern kingdom, which was, refer, which was referred to as Israel, to be conquered by whom? Assyria. And they were exiled into captivity in 722 B.C. as a judgment and a punishment for their sins. Now from time to time, but not consistently, the southern kingdom kind of paid attention to what happened to the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is referred to in the Old Testament as Judah. They, they, they knew what had happened to the northern kingdom because the northern kingdom didn't obey God. So sometimes they kind of did okay, but it didn't last, and eventually the southern kingdom also ended up ignoring God's covenant. They neglected the Sabbath day and the sabbatical year. They got into idolatry, and thus God chose Nebuchadnezzar 
and the nation of Babylon as his instrument to inflict discipline upon the southern kingdom, just as he had used the nation of Assyria to inflict discipline and judgment upon the northern kingdom. Now, did God have to make King Nebuchadnezzar come in there and conquer them? No. Now, all we had to do was what? Right. Allow it. To take his hands off of Israel and allow them to be conquered and dominated. We all we say it many times. God does not have to make evil people do evil things. What he has to do is just allow them to do it. Keep his hands off. Not protect Israel. That's all he had to do. As described here in these verses we opened with in Daniel chapter 1, King Nebi exiled uh, King Jehoiakim. He was king of the southern kingdom, uh, kingdom of Judah. He also took some of the treasures from the Jewish temple and took them to Babylon and put them in the temple of his gods. His intent was probably to show that his gods were more powerful than the God of Israel. Again, this was the first invasion in 605. If you remember from last week, how many different invasions were there of King Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem? Three. 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 And this was the first one in 605 B.C. And from the very beginning of what the Holy Spirit, Spirit led Daniel to write in this account, from the very beginning, it's clear that Nebi's success, King Nebi's success, was not just because of his power and his abilities and his wisdom and so forth. It was the one true God, the Yahweh of armies, who brought about the complete collapse of the line of kings descended from David and the expulsion of many Jews from Jerusalem into exile in Babylon. Because it was Yahweh who gave the Jews into Nebi's power. It was Yahweh's hand that could eventually deliver them from that bondage. But it was the hand of God that was removed. His hand of protection that was removed from Israel. So that this all happened. You think God couldn't have stopped this? And in that way, He chose not to stop it as judgment. He used what the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar did as punishment against the southern kingdom. I say again, the absolute sovereignty of God in all of this is clear throughout the book of Daniel. Let's look at verses 3 through 7. 3 through 7. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, now that's King Nebi, ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve where? In the king's palace. Which king? In Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Talk about this in a minute. He was to teach them, this Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, was to teach these young men the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. They were, these Jews, these young Jews were to be trained and indoctrinated. And then they would enter into serving King Nebuchadnezzar in his court. Verse 6, among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, what? Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. And so we see in these verses that King Nebi also took some of the young men from families of prominence in Judah to Babylon as captives. Maybe some of the reason he took some of these young men from prominent families in Judah was, remember, this wasn't the complete decimation of Jerusalem yet. There were still lots of Jews there. And, and Nebi just deported some of the people. But he was maybe giving them some incentive. Look, we got some of your young men up here. You better, better be good and listen to me and don't rebel against me down there and so forth. Or maybe we'll do away with your family members that we have up here. But it also appears that Nebi intended to take these young men who likely would have been future leaders in Judah to become leaders in Babylon. Alexander the Great, I talked about last week, he, he ended up being 
uh, putting together the, the big empire, world empire of what? Greek. Greek. Yeah, it was a Greek empire. Um, he... He, uh, later on, did the same kind of thing Nebi did. It looks like they had this policy to, um, when they would conquer lands, they would look for some of the sharpest of the young men, and they would actually take them and train them and integrate them into service in their government and in their palace and so forth, so that they didn't have just native Babylonians. Nebi didn't have just native Babylonians serving in his court. When he conquered an area, he would scarf some of the, some of the most prominent young men, the, the up and coming young men in that in that area and take them to Babylon and he would actually put them into his government and into his into his court and his uh, palace grounds and so forth. And that, that seems to be what was what was going on here. Alexander the Great later on did the same the same kind of thing. The plan seemed to be to pull together the, the the best brains and abilities he could find in the ranks of all the nations that he conquered and have them come and serve in Babylon underneath him. So since the hostages from the southern kingdom of Judah included some of the finest of the, the royal family and other young men who had had training and education and so forth, special opportunities were, were given to these gifted young Jews in Babylon. And the most famous of these captive young men, of course, were, as we read about, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All four of their names honored God. All four of their the, the Jewish names often you know, had a meaning behind them. All four of these guys' names um, honored God. For example, Daniel's name, the word, the name Daniel means, God is my judge. Well, therefore, Nebi's official that was in charge of them renamed them all. And he renamed them with Babylonian names that would give honor to Babylonian gods. And for example, for example, he he named Daniel, as we read, what? Remember? Bel Belteshazzar, which meant may Bel protect his life. Bel was one of the Babylonian gods. And so they even changed, that's why they changed their names, so that they took names that had honored the, the God of Israel, they, they got they took away those names, said, you're not going to be referred to that here, and they gave them Babylonian names that referred to Babylonian gods, which, of course, didn't even exist, but that's another story. Ironically, which names of the other three besides Daniel, uh, w w which names, their, their original Jewish name or their Babylonian name, do we most know them by? <laughs> the Babylonian name, because their Babylonian names were what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the, those are the names that we ironically know the best. So Daniel's ministry as a prophet of God essentially began when he got exiled to Babylon in 605 B.C., as we are going to see very soon here in the book of Daniel. Just for perspective, first of all, how many, how many uh, major, what we call major prophets in the Old Testament are there? How many major prophets? What we call the major prophets. It's not a very big number. Four. Four. Yes. And they are, first one, Isaiah, then Jeremiah, Jeremiah then Ezekiel. Ezekiel, then Daniel. Yes. And so, just, just, just for perspective, again, Jeremiah began his ministry as a prophet about 22 years earlier than Daniel, around 627 B.C. Ezekiel began his ministry as a prophet about 13 years later, five, af five years after he and another group of Jews were exiled to Babylon as a part of the second invasion of Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon in 597 B.C. Isaiah's time as a prophet was over 75 years before. His, his, Isaiah's prophetic ministry ended 75 years before Daniel's began. And so those, again, are the four, what we call the major prophets of the, Old, of the Old Testament. Let's look at verses 8 through 16. Let me get down to some of the details here. 8 through 16. But Daniel resolved not to divide himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Understand, if you didn't catch it, the king prescribed from his own table food and drink to be given to these young men so that they, over this course of their training time, so that they would be in the most tip-top shape and health and so forth. Well, Daniel resolved, it says, not to defile himself with that food and wine. 
and he asked the chief official for permission not to define himself in that way. We'll be talking about this. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. You don't miss that. What does it say? God had caused what? Official. Had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. How would God have caused that? Did he come down and talk to him? No. Supernaturally, right? We'll talk about that, but again, this is the first mention of many in the book of Daniel of supernatural acts of God. That God supernaturally impacted this official so that he would respond favorably to Daniel's request in this case. Verse 10 says, But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. That's test Daniel and the other three. Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. And so he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So, first of all, I want to say, I hope that it is clear to y'all that Daniel was not determined to avoid the king's food and drink because he thought it was unhealthy. That, that was not what Daniel was concerned about. And I'll explain in a little bit why I say that. The problem was that according to the Mosaic Law, to which Daniel and the other three, still being good godly young men, still knew that they were obligated to, to that law, and that would have forbade them from eating and drinking these things, probably because it was things like unclean meat according to the law, food not prepared in accordance with the law, certain foods that were outright prohibited by the law, um, no matter how they were prepared, food and drink maybe that had been offered to idols first, etc. That was the issue. The reason Daniel and the other three didn't want to eat this food from the king, food and drink this drink from the, the king's table, was because it, for various reasons it would have been a violation of the Mosaic law. And these were godly young men. Daniel respectfully stood strong for his faith, and he asked permission not to eat the prescribed food and drink of the king. And verse 9, as I said, um, it says that God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, and that likely indicates, again, that otherwise the official probably wouldn't have had any part of it. He would have tried to make them eat the food and drink the drink of the king. And as I said, it's the first of many supernatural acts of God recorded here. I want to tell you the Hebrew word in this account that is translated here, vegetables, it probably most literally that Hebrew word can be translated as sown things or things planted in the ground. And so it's often translated vegetables, but um, most literally if it's they ate of things that were planted in the ground, many believe that that could have included grains. In other words, grain products, bread and things like that made out of those would also, of course, are planted in the, in the ground. So it's corn and anything made any, out of any of those kinds of grains. Many believe that that was all that this word translated vegetables is could be translated a, a little bit differently to include grains. So although God had prompted the Babylonian official to respond favorably to Daniel, the official was still understandably fearful. He was fearful probably of losing his job, but he's also fearful of what? Losing his head. Is, is, is what he said. He'll have my head if he knows that I didn't do what he told me to do. So if these four young men ended up looking worse than the others because they didn't eat the royal food, drink the royal drink, and so forth then this guy knew he would be in big trouble. But Daniel came up with a plan for the official to allow Daniel and his three friends on a trial basis to, to not eat that food and eat only what, they, what Daniel asked for. And he said, see what we look like then after the ten days. Compare what we look like with what all the other young men look like and then you, you do with us as you see fit after that. 
Well, I would guess, of course, that it had to be a surprise to the Babylonian that after the 10 days, what was the result? They actually looked, Daniel and the other three actually looked better than all the other young men that were eating all the, you know, all the good food. I would guess that it had at least as much to do with God's blessing of them, God's hand upon them, as, to, you know, as it did as far as what they did or didn't eat. And maybe it really had everything to do with God's intervention. I, I don't know. In any case, here, here's where I want to track back to, to why I said Daniel wasn't refer, refusing to eat this stuff. And these guys weren't saying that they weren't going to eat this stuff because they were worried about it not being healthy. Why did I say that? Well, many people use these passages to uh, supposedly point to some kind of a biblical diet. Um, you know, that, that you should... If you eat this, if you if you eat the way Daniel said what they wanted to eat, then you're you're insured to have you're insured to have you know really good health and so forth. And it's certainly not a biblical plug for vegetarianism. Now, if if you're here and you're vegetarian, I, I'm not trying to offend you, um, but don't offend me by saying I can't eat my meat either. So, but anyway, it, that what that had nothing to do with this, nothing to do with it. And I have to mention it though because you'd be surprised how many people point to these passages. To to support their views about what you should or shouldn't eat. And, and there's other passages in the Bible too that are very much misused. And um, not too many of you, might, a couple of you, um, there was an old pastor, I don't know if he's still, um, I was just going to say his name, he was from Texas. He, 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 he was one that talked about this, about, you know, eating the way Daniel did or whatever. But anyway, there are people that think that, but that really, that, that's not what was the deal here. The point is that Daniel and his three friends sought to do the right thing and God blessed it. They sought to do the right thing and follow the law, follow the Mosaic law, and God blessed them for it. Many scholars conclude that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were in their early teens when they were taken captive. And the Hebrew word translated young men in verse 4 that we read earlier supports that theory. It would not have been easy. And here's where, if, you know, if you're fading and you don't care about any of this stuff, all this is background to what was going on, but please come back to me now. Listen to what I have to say here. It would not have been easy for these young teenagers to do what they were doing. To submit to the Babylonian rule. They had been godly young men. They had been the cream of Judah's crop. Members of nobility among the most promising young men in their nation. Now they're in a foreign land. Their captors had taken away their Jewish names and given them new names that would identify them with pagan gods. Honestly, it could have been easy for them to say... Hey, we were trying to be godly. The heck with it, right? Look, what's that got? What's that got us? Where did that bring us? I tried to do the godly things that we tried to do what was right. We tried to obey our God, and here we are. Would have been easier for him to say that, right? Do you see where I'm going to go with the application for today? Oftentimes, and the Bible talks about this a lot, I, and I've got to be careful I don't run too long with this particular little diatribe, but the, in fact, Psalm 73, I think it is, 72 or 73, I never remember which one, but the psalmist says, Why, Lord, why did the righteous suffer and the evil prosper? You know, and he goes on and through all this stuff, and eventually, till, till he gets to the end of his diatribe, he says, I, I get it, Lord. Eventually, eventually the evil will be condemned. They will be punished for eternity. And, and the righteous, those who are truly of God, will receive eternal rewards. Okay, I get it. I can't make all my judgments just on this life. But these guys, these young men, teenagers, could have easily taken that position and said, Heck with it. Let's eat the king's food. Yeah, we might as well. What, what did a being of God get us, right? We, we can make those same kinds of assessments ourselves today still. They could have decided it didn't matter whether they obeyed God or not. Some people think that there were actually other young Jewish men besides these four, and that these four were the only Jewish young men who obeyed God, took a stand against eating and drinking what God had forbidden. 
And in this first situation that Daniel was involved in that, were, that is described for us here in this book, Daniel's use of his divinely appointed leadership gives us our first glance, our first glimpse of his high character, his extraordinary character, really. Now again, moving this to application, there was a, a woman named Stella Ho who lived in Venezuela for 30 years running a shop with her unsaved husband. In January of 2004, Stella was abducted by three thieves. God used her compassionate spirit and her godly influence to actually change the hearts of those who took her captive. In just eight days, the hearts of Stella's captors were changed, Stella was set free, and her husband accepted Jesus after witnessing the outpour of prayer and love from her fellow believers. Afterwards, Stella said, Our time here on earth is short. We never know what may happen to us. We must strive to serve the Lord and discern what we can do for God. If Daniel had been allowed to plot out his own course of his, of his life, I don't think he would have picked being taken captive and exiled to Babylon, do you? Do you think if it was his choice, that would have been the, the path that he chose? He didn't get to choose his circumstances. None of us do, right? When these kinds of things happen in life. But he served the Lord by accepting the position in which God had placed him. Allowed him to be in. We remember Daniel for his courageous stands against compromise, but... Precept Austin Commentary said the first test of Daniel's allegiance to God was one of humble submission to his circumstances. Okay? If this is where I'm at, if this is the deal, I wouldn't have picked this. He's probably separated from family, friends, in a foreign land, captive. But he chose to serve God as best he could in the circumstances he found himself in. He humbly accepted and submitted to the circumstances into which God allowed him to be placed. Folks, the prophet Daniel, Daniel's three friends, Stella Ho, that I told the story about there briefly, they set a high standard for us today, right? When we read, when we hear about these everyday people just like us, and what they have done in the past, their willingness to serve God in the circumstances in which they were placed. What a high bar that sets for us. How do we handle undesirable, difficult circumstances in our lives? How do we deal with it? Do we take the position, well, God, you know, if this is what you're giving me, you know, what, what's the use of trying to follow you if this is what I get for it, right? Do not people do that? Have not many of us at least thought that sometimes? I'll be the first one to say yes. Are we willing to take a stand against sin? Even if we'll suffer because of it. Because we do. Daniel and the other three young men weren't in Jerusalem anymore. They were where? They were in Babylon. I ask these questions in part to at least try to keep you engaged. Yeah, I know it should have been a pretty obvious answer there. They were in Babylon. But they were convicted to obey God no matter where they were and no matter what the situation was that they were in. Again, what about us? What do you do when you are in a Babylon, so to speak? Maybe your Babylon's in your workplace. Maybe it's in school. Maybe your Babylon is bad health, great sorrow. Maybe your Babylon is, is being in the midst of mo uh, friends who are mostly all, or maybe all unbelievers. Whatever your Babylon is, keeping a godly attitude and remaining faithful and obedient is pretty hard sometimes, isn't it? Man, it is. We, we know it is. You know it is. Do we have the spiritual maturity and the spiritual strength to remain faithful when times stink, when things really get bad? Do we even think about looking at our circumstances that way? 
You know what I mean? I mean, like when things are really bad, do we even think about, Lord, help me, Holy Spirit. I want to, I want to hear this, this, is, this is bad. This stinks. This hurts. Whatever. I, I, I want to handle it the way you want me to handle it, Lord. Do we even think that way to start with? Are we even willing to try? Believe me, I'm not saying this is easy. But I'm saying, you think it was easy for Daniel and the other three? You, you think it was easy for Stella Ho? And many others have gone before us. Many others are doing it right now. Verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So although Daniel and his three friends were being prepared by King Nebi for positions of responsibility in Nebi's royal court, they were in reality being prepared by whom? God. And God gave them knowledge and understanding in many areas of learning. The intentions of God always supersede the intentions of people, including the intentions of kings. Of course, Scripture tells us that kings are even kings in the first place. Why? Because God has declared that it will be so. Although King Nebi was preparing these young men to serve him, God was using the king's preparations and giving the young men abilities so that they could ultimately serve who? God. Him. God. Verse 17 indicates that Daniel alone would be especially enabled by God to do what? Uh, understand and interpret dreams. We will see later that actually this ability wasn't like the what all four men received relative to their ability of overall knowledge, but rather Daniel would go to God with a dream. Daniel would either see the great dream himself or someone else would see it and tell it to him. And then Daniel would take that to God in prayer and say, Okay, Lord, what does this mean? That's what we're going to see. That's how it would end up working. Now, I would never suggest that any of us will be given such dramatically powerful um, abilities if we, if we just obey God with some level of sufficient commitment to Him. But still, even though likely none of us will ever get anything that dramatic that God will enable us to do, still the Word of God does say elsewhere that we can receive wisdom and understanding from God. Do you know that? The Bible says we can have from God wisdom and understanding. And it says we should seek it. And that we should actually, what? Ask for it from Him. The Bible also says He gives more direct guidance. He gives more direct guidance to people who obey Him. And so if you see the connection, the more we are living the way God calls us to live, the more guidance He will give us. And sometimes we say, oh, I just can't, I don't know what God's telling me, I don't, know, I don't know what He wants me to do. You know, Maybe first we need to ask ourselves, how much am I obeying Him? Maybe God's not giving me much guidance because I got the cart before the horse. I need to get my right life right with God. I need to be living in obedience to Him. I need to be a follower of Jesus. Like the Bible says a follower of Jesus is supposed to be. And then maybe I'll get some of this guidance. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You can also see Daniel chapter 2 verse 21, which we'll obviously get to later. Psalm 51 verse 6, Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6. All references to we can receive wisdom and understanding from God. If we seek it and if we're living lives that are deserving of receiving it. Verses 18 through 20. Hang in there. Home stretch. Home stretch. We're in it. 18 through 20. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. 
In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them what? Ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So when the three-year three period, three period of training came to an end, King Nebi talks with the, these and questions these young Jewish men, and he found that in all areas of wisdom and understanding, wisdom and understanding, and where were they getting their wisdom and understanding? God. From God, right? In all areas of wisdom and understanding, they were ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, ten times better, it, like, Nebi didn't somehow have a calculation he ran. It's just like when we say, I have a million things to do. You know, we don't really have a million. It's just an expression. It just says, Nebi saw that they were far advanced over all the other young men in wisdom and understanding. And that's, of course, because God was giving them theirs. The book of Daniel says that at various times King Nebi uh, consulted magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, and diviners. F like, uh, uses those different terms uh, a lot of different times, and, and a lot of times those terms can be lumped together and they are just referred to as what? Wise men. Just as, as wise men. Good. And so the practices of those different groups of people probably overlapped to various degrees. But, and some of you might remember that during uh, Christmas, when I talked about, the, you know, we talked about the Magi, the, well, the wise men at Christmas time. Some of you might remember that I mentioned, even this year, I know, in one of our service, I don't know, maybe it was a Bible study or something, but, you know, when the wise men that came from the east, you understand Babylon was to the east. And so those wise men that came from the east, that maybe they were actually even de descendants of the, the wise men that Daniel spoke to when he was there hundreds of years before. Likely, many scholars believe Daniel talked to the wise men of Babylon about what the Hebrew Scriptures say, said about the coming, the promise of a baby who would be born to be a king of the Jews. And that that got passed down from generation to generation in, there in that eastern region, and that maybe those wise men, the Magi, who came to, to find and worship and honor the baby Jesus, that maybe that that, their prompting to even know about that had been passed down from what Daniel taught, taught and talked to the wise men of Babylon hundreds and hundreds of years before when he was there. Verse 21. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus would have been who? The first, the first king of... The king that did what? The king that conquered who? Well, not Nebuchadnezzar, because he, he died and there were other kings that followed him when Babylon was still a king of the block. But the next kingdom was which kingdom? The Medo-Persian kingdom. And King Cyrus was a Persian king. And, and so, anyway, that's, that's from what we covered last week in the introduction. That's how it ties into here. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. It, it's a summary statement in this chapter 1 of saying Daniel was in, was in the, the palace of, of the kings of Babylon clear up until whenever the Medo-Persian kingdom conquered Babylon. And King Cyrus was that Persian king who, who, who led that. So again, Daniel's service in the royal court of Babylon continued uh, until the overthrow of the Babylonian Empire by Cyrus in 539 B.C. God had set the nation of Israel apart to be His light to the world. Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. You study the Old Testament, you will see that. Did Israel do that very well? No, they did not. They were to receive God's revelation and they were, they were supposed to communicate it to the nations of the world. But Israel as a nation failed to fulfill their God-given responsibility. Daniel, while he was in Babylon, did fulfill that function as God's spokesman to the Gentiles. And someday, someday when the nation of Israel finally accepts Jesus as their Messiah... 
which will be again when Jesus returns to this earth at the end of the millennial or at the end of the tribulation period and Jesus establishes that millennial kingdom he finally establishes that promised kingdom of Israel that God said he would eventually give her then Israel will fulfill the role for which she was set apart by God she will communicate God's truths to the Gentiles in the millennial kingdom in the introduction last week, I talked about the sovereignty of God being one of the central truths of the book of Daniel. When the Bible says that God is sovereign, it means He is in control of what? Everything. Everything. Nothing surprises Him. He never encounters a situation He can't do anything about. Every person, every animal, every tree, every turn of the earth, every star, every law of physics... Everything answers to God because God created it all. God is in control. God never says, oops. And here's a little illustration. A West Texas cowboy applied for a life insurance. The agent asked him if he had ever had any accidents. The cowboy said, nope. The agent said, you mean nothing has ever happened to you? You've never been hurt? Well, said the cowpoke, once I was bitten by a rattler and a buck and bronc threw me and busted my arm one time. Well, the agent said, well, wouldn't you call those accidents? Heck no, said the cowboy. Them critters have done it on purpose. <laughs> the point of that little ditty is that there are no accidents with God. And it's not because of the point of the view like the cowboy in the story. But the biblical doctrine of the sovereignty of God finds support throughout Scripture. God knows what He's doing, and He is doing it. Theologian Arthur Pink once called the sovereignty of God, quote, the foundation of Christian theology and the center of gravity in the system of Christian truth. It is a source of strength and comfort for the Christian in the midst of the storms of life. Daniel, of course, had known that since his childhood. King Nebi learned about the one true God and his sovereign power in a series of dramatic events, which we're going to be studying in the following chapters here in the book of Daniel. Daniel was committed to God, and God used Daniel as his messenger. God has likewise used countless other people in the centuries that have passed since then. God still uses folks today. The question is, are you, like Daniel was, committed to God? Will you be His messenger? F.B. Meyer was a dynamic preacher. He was an author of more than 70 books. When he was 17 years old, 17 Think how young, again, Daniel and the other three were probably even younger than that when they first got to Babylon. But F.B. Meyer, 17 years old, he believed the Lord was calling him into full-time ministry. He talked about it with his mother, and she pointed out that being in the ministry would involve sacrifice and, and many trying times. But then she also mentioned that if later on he regretted taking that step, he could always leave ministry. F.B. Meyer looked his mother in the eye and said, Never, mother. Never. That would be putting my hand to the plow and looking back. What was he referring to at 17 years old? A Bible verse. A Bible verse that says essentially, and who's, who's quoted in the Bible verse? Jesus. Good. And Jesus said what? Luke, Luke 9, 62. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for what? For service in the kingdom of God. That's what 17-year-old F.B. Meyer said to his mother when she suggested that he could just back out of it after he entered into it. He said, never. Someone who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back isn't fit for service in the kingdom of God. Through God's grace, F.B. Meyer did not waver from his high calling. He maintained a vigorous ministry serving Jesus Christ. And many have pointed to his decision as a 17-year-old, as a watershed act, a resolve that carried him through an entire lifetime of service to the Lord. 
And the question is, how is your resolve here this morning? How would you rate your resolve in comparison to the young 17-year-old F.B. Myers' resolve, in comparison to the four young Jewish boys in their mid-teens, their resolve. The urging from the Precept Austin commentary is, Today in prayer give thanks to Jesus Christ that He rewards those who seek Him in all that they do. And so, one more time, I ask, what do you choose today? What, what is your choice? It's, again, I'm speaking to a group, but these choices are ours as individuals. What do you, as an individual, choose today? Are you committed to a life of serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you walk out this door knowing, in your heart, I am committed to serving my Lord Jesus Christ with my life? Thou my everlasting portion, more than a friend or life to me. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me anybody now? walk with Thee. Close to Thee, Savior, let me walk with Thee. Not for ease, not for worldly pleasure, nor for my fame my prayer shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with Thee. Close to Thee, only let me walk with Thee. Lead me through the veil of shadows. Bear me o'er life's fitful sea. Then the gate of life eternal may I enter, Lord, with Thee. Close to Thee, may I enter, Lord, with Thee. Those are the lyrics of the closing hymn. As I often ask you, will you sing it like you mean it? Written by the blind woman, Fanny Crosby. Close to thee, 607, please stand as we sing in closing. 607.